Hey everybody, welcome back to Spatial Statistics. We are about to start our second unit, um, which I'm calling Geostatistics, and it um, all has to do with how to deal with point reference data. If you recall, that's when the locations themselves are fixed and the data varies across those locations. So this is just part one of uh, what will be two parts to this unit, uh, and we will have um, our second activity in between part one and part two. Okay, so with that, let me spend a little, just a tiny bit of time reviewing uh, where we've been so far. Um, so my personal definition of spatial correlation is similar data at similar locations. And uh, what I call is as the corollary of that is that we have dissimilar or different data at dissimilar or different locations. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because the analyses and techniques that we'll be learning are going to be much more closely aligned to this definition than the one we've had so far. So dissimilar data means we're gonna be looking for differences in the data at locations that are basically far apart. So if the similarity in the data um, can be measured by positive correlation. Uh, we'll take a look in just a couple of slides how we measure dissimilarity in the data. And um, dissimilarity in location, of course, we'll be using a distance metric, and locations are going to be dissimilar when they're far apart according to some um, distance metric. So the big idea, really, and I, and I alluded to this a little bit in the first unit, is you collect data across space, and then you will fit your usual regression model. The first step is to take a look at what the residuals um, from that kind of um, simple regression model produce. You will be determining, using exploratory data analysis, if there is spatial correlation present in your data, but data is gonna be more like residuals. Residuals from a regression model. And if you determine that there is non-trivial spatial correlation that is present, then you will be fitting some of the uh, more sophisticated spatial models that we'll go through um, in, unit, in the second part of this unit. If you fit your usual regression model, you run these exploratory data analyses, and there is not a strong spatial correlation present, you can stop right there. You don't need these sophisticated spatial models, okay? So the journey of a thousand miles begins with notation. Notation is boring, but notation is important so that we're all on the same page. So our outcome variable will be y, and it'll be measured at some set of known locations. Our locations, and in fact, take a look at this, notation right here. It's y depending on our location coordinate. So our outcome variable depends on where we measure it. The next bit is that our locations are an element of the spatial domain. D is the spatial domain. That is contained within, and then here we have our script R, real numbers, um, and the exponent, whether we have coordinates on a line, coordinates on a plane, coordinates on a cube, or something more than a cube. Okay, that was super formal. What we're, um, this is usually a first sentence in the methods section of a spatial stats paper, where you're saying that my variable y is measured at these locations, and these locations, and in fact, my entire spatial domain, so that is um, what you're trying to measure geographically using your locations. You can't possibly measure every single point inside of a spatial domain, but you're trying to represent a spatial domain using your n locations. And then you're telling the reader what is the um, dimensionality of the coordinate system that you're working with. 
You can apply, by the way, all of these spatial methods to just time, and there's a single dimension, a single coordinate. Another area of application where you have a single coordinate, so where d little d equals one, is, uh, for example, um, I'm told that in a genetic sequence, um, the each gene has a unidimensional coordinate. And you can treat the differences, the distances along that unidimensional coordinate to tell us something about um, these genes. We'll be mostly operating in two dimensions. And I think I mentioned this last time, um, just putting a little bit more uh, precise language around this. 95, over 95% of spatial analyses, um, at least in, in, the, in my field, occur in this R2. So this are, these are coordinates on a plane, latitude and longitude, easting and northing, easting and northing in kilometers, easting and northing in miles, etc. Sometimes you will see a paper or two that introduce something like depth or altitude, and then the, all of this stuff, or a lot of this stuff, is defined for dimensions greater than three. But we, we don't want to bother ourselves too much with, you know, four or five dimensional coordinates uh, because, well, frankly, they're fairly theoretical. Um, Space-time data is a slightly different animal that doesn't quite fit this exact notation. Okay, so that was um, all, of, all of my comments about uh, a quarter of a line of notation. So it's important notation, but it's mostly just telling the reader uh, how our outcome variable is indexed and that our coordinates have one, two, three, or more than three dimensions. Okay, moving on. We have a set of n locations. So here is my set of n, lo n locations. Um, and our outcome variable, usually just the outcome variable at all n locations is bolded. Um, and here again, we're pretty formal about the dependence of the outcome variable on location. You will notice that in almost all um, spatial papers, at least that I, I've read, this location S is a vector because it consists of two or three elements. So something like latitude and longitude northing and easting, lat long altitude, lat long depth. So that's why it's usually bolded, right? Everywhere it is bolded. And then the next bit is also very important. We say that the collection of observations, the collection of observations across all n locations, almost always, at least in this unit, has a multivariate normal distribution. And sometimes you will see this called a Gaussian process. Depending on the field you're reading, um, it will, a Gaussian process would be referred to as a multivariate normal distribution and vice versa. For example, I'm aware that in computer science, um, Gaussian processes are pretty common and they reflect the same thing as a multivariate normal distribution. So here is a little bit of what we are talking about. I just want to make um, a slide for myself. I apologize. Okay, I'm just going to start drawing. So we're saying that our collection of observations, which is an n by one vector, right, n rows, one column, this tilde is distributed as distributed as multivariate normal, and it's an n-dimensional multivariate normal. The multivariate normal, pretty similar to a normal, has uh, a mean vector and a variance covariance matrix. So. Here is going to be my n by one mean 
vector. And then we have sigma, which is going to be the variance covariance dash there matrix. And this matrix is going to be n by n. So even right here, if n is very large, so even something like 10,000, this is a pretty complex problem. We have a 10,000 by one vector here, and then right over here we have a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. So that matrix has 10,000 squared elements. That is a lot for a computer to store and a lot for us to understand without imposing some type of structure on the data. So let's take a look at this variance covariance matrix a little bit more. So my variance covariance matrix, sigma, I can write it as sigma squared, which is my variance, times, and I will say R, because this is going to be my correlation matrix. Remember we talked about that the correlation is just a scaled version of the covariance, and it's scaled by the variance. So I can rewrite our variance covariance matrix as the variance times the correlation matrix, which is going to be n by n. This helps me a little bit because I now don't have to worry about the main diagonal of my correlation matrix. The correlation matrix has ones on the main diagonal. And just to be clear, we have n such terms. Now it's also symmetric, just like the variance covariance matrix. And each element, each element reflects the correlation between any two between the data at any two locations, to be very clear. Correlations between the data at any two locations. And if you notice how I wrote that, the variable I measure is the same, but what changes is the location from SI to SJ. So let me kind of, um, we're talking about notation. I'm laying down some notation now. We'll cover it again in the second part of this unit, but I, um, this stuff, I don't know how much exposure you guys have had to this. Um, this would be something that you would see more of in like a multivariate class or in like a matrix algebra a stats flavored matrix algebra class. In our class here, we're gonna be seeing this multivariate normal distribution a lot. The multivariate normal distribution has two areas where the parameters come in. The first one is the mean vector. The second one is the variance covariance matrix. The mean vector, I, it's actually not that um, interesting. Um, you can get the mean vector pretty easily by just the usual x prime beta. Because your x prime is your design matrix, that is n by p. p is the number of covariates you have. Your beta vector is p by one. And so what you get is an n by one mean vector. So that is not that interesting. This is, this is okay. The interesting bit, at least for a spatial statistician, is all about this variance covariance matrix. This variance covariance matrix contains information about the covariance between all n locations. It is helpful to think of this 
variance covariance matrix is almost always written as sigma as being the variance times the correlation matrix that is also n by n. But the correlation matrix is already a little bit easier to think about because the main diagonal is fixed at one. And the off diagonal terms reflect the correlation between your outcomes at various locations. And of course, the correlation mat matrix, just like the variance covariance matrix, is symmetric. So that is everything that we are saying when we claim that our y is distributed according to our multivariate normal distribution, or equivalently, that y has a Gaussian process. So notice that this is different. I, I don't have something like IID here, uh, which stands for independently and identically distributed, because I observe all n things at the same time. What constitutes a single realization from a multivariate normal, an n-dimensional multivariate normal, is the whole n by one vector. This entire n by one vector is a single realization from this n-dimensional multivariate normal, where these describe the systematic variability and us observing different realizations of this n by one vector reflects random variability. So, so let's go back here. We will routinely work with a single realization of an n-dimensional multivariate norm. That should blow your minds because uh, outside of spatial stats, when we record n things, we're saying that we're actually measuring the same process and times. And we make certain assumptions. IID assumption independently and identically distributed. That helps us out. But here we work with a single realization of an n-dimensional multivariate normal, right? We don't have n observations. We basically have a observation size of one. This makes estimation hard. But the only way we're able to operate the only way we're able to operate is that we know or hope the nearby observations are similar. Nearby observations, the observations that are not far apart in space that, have, that are similar in location are similar in their data. So I'm basically describing spatial correlation and this helps impose structure on the data. So let me go back to this slide I just drew and actually just focus us a little bit on just this correlation matrix. Without imposing any structure on the data, we would have to estimate all of these off diagonal terms using just a single realization. Let me repeat that just a little bit. We have to estimate all of these off diagonal terms and all we have is a single realization of a multivariate normal. The only way we're able to do this is if we impose structure of how correlation varies as a function of space. We'll be looking to impose a structure on how our correlation decays as a function of space or even more precisely, distance. Okay, so this has been an introduction to this type of thinking and we'll be covering this again when we deal with um, isotropic and anisotropic spatial models. For now, let's take a short step back and discuss the classic variogram. So the variogram is a relatively old tool. Um, it was the first described by George Maveron. Uh, there's an emphasis on this syllable right here. It's Maveron, Mather, Maveron. I don't know, I'll have to check. Maybe some of you can uh, comment. It's been around for a while. 
and people like to hate on the variogram, myself included. But if you look around the literature, it's still a pretty common tool that is used. So here, I will point out the power of the variogram and also the many uh, pitfalls of a variogram. I will also say that, although we'll be learning quite a bit about the variogram, um, it is rare that you would stop at the variogram. It is uh, often a stepping stone to a more formal spatial model that you can then use uh, for inference, for prediction, to compare against the non-spatial model. So we will be spending some time on this stepping stone, but I'm big on exploratory data analysis. And, and this is especially true when you have a single realization of an n-dimensional multivariate norm. Okay, enough of that. The classic semivariogram, it tracks how the differences in the data change as a function of distance between locations on average. So this really nicely fits with my corollary of spatial correlation, dissimilar data at dissimilar locations. We're tracking dissimilarities in the data as a function of distance between locations on average. We have to make some assumptions. So the first one that is super important is called weak stationarity, also sometimes called second order stationarity. Here's what it means. It means that the mean, the variance, and the covariance function The covariance function, okay, so we know what the mean is, we know what the variance is. The covariance function is the way in which we impose structure on that correlation matrix. The co covariance function, we'll be talking about it more later, but that is what we use to say how correlation among observations decays as a function of distance. So we need the mean, the variance, and the covariance function do not vary in space. But the covariance function is allowed to decay with distance. So the covariance function depends only on distance between observations, not on the location. All right, I will draw what this means. We're looking to, uh, for our data to meet the second order stationarity or the weak stationarity assumption. We need the mean, the variance, and the covariance functions to not vary in space. So we need detrended data. By the way, residuals pretty frequently meet this assumption. We need a homogeneous variance. So from regression class, you may have talked about heteroskedasticity and homoskedasticity. We need that homoskedasticity. We need the variance to not vary as a function of data or as a, uh, in our world, a function of space. Covariance function is how we will be imposing uh, um, a rule for how correlation decays with distance. That rule can't vary across space. What can vary inside this covariance function is that the correlation between observations will depend only on the interpoint distance, distance between observations, and not on the locations themselves. So, Here's what I mean by this. So here is our um, state of Wyoming, a beautiful state of Wyoming. Here are two observations here. Here are two observations here. Here are two observations here. And here are two observations here. All 
equally equidistant, equally far from, let me be more precise. The triangles are equidistant from each other. The, cir the dots, the circles, are equidistant from each other. The x's are equidistant from, from each other. And the squares are equidistant from each other. So all of my little brackets are equal. What second order stationarity means is that we impose that correlation is the same for the pairs of dots, triangles, it's a triangle, x's, and squares. Let me go back. The covariance function depends only on the distance between observations. So we are allowed to say that the, these two triangles are more correlated than these two triangles. But we are not allowed to have our covariance function be different in the northwest quadrant, then in the southwest quadrant, then in the northeast quadrant, then in the southeast quadrant. We're saying that we're basically going to be average, averaging the spatial correlation across our entire spatial domain. That's that capital D from the earlier notation. And I'll, I, I know this is kind of a tough assumption to um, relay. And so when we are dealing with examples, I will uh, keep pointing, pointing it out. Okay. The other one is isotropy isotropy for now. The reason why I, I draw this one first, I write this one first, is because this is the one that we really will not be um, relaxing. The assumption of weak stationarity, we will not be relaxing. The assumption of isotropy, we will be relaxing. But formally speaking, the assumptions required are that correlation in space is omnidirectional, so does not depend on direction. Does not depend on direction. These are my two assumptions of the data for the semivariogram to work. Okay, moving right along. Presenting a lot of information, but you guys have um, office hours, you can uh, backtrack this video, and I can keep trying. I, I've been thinking about how to explain second order stationarity. I hope that when we're at the end of this unit, it will make more sense than my scribbles thus far. Okay, we're building up to the semi barograph We're trying to see how dissimilarity in the data varies as a function of distance. So the first step is to compute the similarity in the data. We're gonna take half the squared differences between all possible pairs of outcomes. We're gonna take half the squared differences between all possible pairs of outcomes. Right? This is our outcome variable measured at location i, outcome variable measured at location j. For n locations, there are n times n minus 1 divided by 2 pairs. So we will have n times n minus 1 over 2 of these values. Half the square difference between all possible pairs of observation. Then 
For each one of these guys, we will also record the distance between them. Most often, we will use the Euclidean distance. And this is the Euclidean norm. Euclidean norm. That's one kind of notation. Notice that we boil down the exact locations to just the distance between them, right? The distance between two locations i and j is now a scalar term. The coordinates that measure each location are a vector, latitude and longitude, etc. But once we pull it through the Euclidean norm, out pops a scalar. So what does this mean? For two-dimensional coordinates, we're going to have the square root of essentially x1 minus xi, I'll say, minus xj squared plus yi minus yj. squared. So if you're dealing with latitudes and longitudes, our x's are going to be the longitudes, our y's are going to be the latitudes. If we're dealing with eastings and northings, our x's are going to be the eastings, our y's are going to be the northings. So we take the difference in the x coordinates, then we take the difference in the y coordinates, we square each one, add it together, and take the square root. With three dimensions, we just add the z coordinate as well. So square root xi minus xj squared plus yi minus yj squared plus zi minus zj squared. Okay, so this is the Euclidean norm, um, you will notice that we have squares on the inside, the square root on the outside. There is a way to generalize this. It's called the Minkowski distance. That's when you actually uh, represent the power that you take this difference as a parameter, say p, and this square root becomes the p root of your some of these differences here. So Euclidean distance is most common. It is by far not the only one, but it's used 99% of the time. All right, we took half the squared differences between all pairs, all n times n minus one pairs. Then for each one of these pairs, we take the Euclidean distance between them. Right, we break out, we break down the coordinate, take the squared difference of the x coordinates, the squared difference of the y coordinates, add it together, take the square root. Finally, plot our distances versus our squared differences. And that gives us what is called a variogram cloud. So here is a toy example. I have five locations. I generated these locations at random in a one by one square, right? This is one by one square. And there they are. And then here are the coordinates. I'm, I'm listing the coordinates right there. I generated these data with a spatially constant mean of one and a spatially constant variance of one. I'm trying to meet weak stationarity. And because I generated these data, these are synthetic data, they meet weak stationarity. All pairwise distances can be summarized in a distance matrix. And annoyingly in spatial statistics, you will run into uh, a lot of different notation. So, I've seen kind of this bolded D be the distance matrix, or I've also seen this bolded H be the distance matrix. Don't ask me why. Our distance matrix is going to be square, 
and symmetric. And the ijth element contains the distance between locations i and j. If you look back to our multivariate normal distribution, this is going to have some similarities to that correlation matrix. Our correlation matrix is going to be square. Our correlation matrix is going to be symmetric. Inside of our correlation matrix, the ijth element contains the correlation of data between loca at locations i and j. So let's practice our intuition. Which two locations are farthest apart? Don't think about it too much, right? Which locations are farthest apart? Well, it's clearly one and two. They're farthest apart. And we'll see how that's reflected in the distance matrix. Which are closest together? Um, it's pretty close, but one and five are closest together. Which location looks to be approximately equidistant from, from, from the others? It's four. Four is kind of in the middle of things. You know, if you think about these arrows, all the arrows are going to be the same. So let's see if our intuition came true. Which were the closest, or sorry, the first, the farthest apart? Here is my distance matrix. The legend reflects how far away things are. First things first, notice that the diagonal is all the same. And the diagonal is zero. Why is that the case? Because when we take the distance between any location with itself, we get zero. Let me go back up here. If I change these j's to i's, it's pretty clear to see that if I take my x-coordinate, I subtract that same x-coordinate, square it, zero squared is zero, plus zero squared is zero. When we are taking the distance between any location with itself, we get zero. So the distance matrix is gonna have zeros in the diagonal. Cool. Which two locations were farthest apart? We said one and two, all right? One and two are far, farthest apart. Yep, that lines up. Farthest apart, uh, the distance of almost one, one and two. Which ones were closest together? Closest together, we said one and five. Looking at this distance matrix, one and five, are closest together, so it's a blue, so something like that. Yeah, that lines up. And there was one location that was essentially equidistant from the others, and that was location four. And you will notice that location four is approximately equidistant to all the other points. Right over here on the rightmost panel, I actually color in the outcome variable on top of the locations. So you will notice that this has a strong spatial correlation. Look, the blue are together, the yellow-ish are together, and then this really high brown dot is all the way outside, uh, away from the others, right? Similar data at similar locations. Similar data and similar locations. Similar data, similar locations. Different data, and it's far away from everything. Okay, so a bit of intuition about the distance matrix and um, how distances among n observations are um, carried through in the analysis. Okay, let's apply what we just learned. So remember, in a classic variogram, we're going to take half the squared difference between all pairs of observations. We're going to take the distances between all pairs of observations, and then we're going to plot them. Distance versus the similarity, the half the squared difference. So how would we know, how would we know that there are 10 pairs 
from five locations. Well, we get n times n minus 1 over 2 pairs. So that means it's 5 times 4 over 2. That's 10 pairs. Cool. Here it is, 10 pairs. By the way, this is the code to um, estimate and plot a variogram. Uh, we'll be using the GSTAT package. Here, I just, this is my fake synthetic data. I have my Eastings and Northings. Basically have my Eastings and Northings. I have my synthetic data set. Here is the variogram function that computes the variogram. I have my outcome variable tilde one. This says that I have no covariates. I just have a constant mean. Locations tell are where the columns with locations. What are those called? Of course, this is the data set, what the data set is called. Cutoff equals square root of two. Cutoff is a very important parameter inside of a variogram because it tells R what is the maximum distance for which to compute the variogram. Very, very important. I'm about to show you later, a little bit later, why that's the case. Why did I pick square root of two? Well, remember, I had a one by one square. The maximum distance in a one by one square That is the square root of two. So I honestly don't know what it would give me as a default, but the other lesson to extract from this is be very careful of defaults. We know we have a one by one square. So for now, because I'm trying to demonstrate all n pairs, I will simply pick the largest possible distance as my cutoff in a, in a one by one square the largest possible distance is the square root of two. Finally, cloud equals true. Tells us that we want to produce this variogram cloud that, we do, that we've been talking about, which uh, gives us the distance between all pairs of observations versus the half the square difference between all pairs of observations. One more thing to do. Let's check our work for the first location pair. So, this gamma term, right, this gamma term right here, where i equals 1 and j equals 2. So we're looking for half the square difference between this value And this value. So 2.3, I'll call it 9, minus a minus gives me plus 0.265. This is approximately equal to 3.535. R then goes through and does this for all 10 pairs. And this is how we get this gamma value. Then we compute the pairwise distance, pairwise Euclidean distance between all 10 pairs. And now we're ready to make a plot. If you count, I have 10 points, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 points. And this is simply a plot of my 10 pairs. So my question is, what is the general trend in this scatter plot? Remember that the y-axis gives us a measure of dissimilarity in the data. And my x-axis gives me a measure of dissimilarity in location. So what is the general trend? And remember, this is way too small. 
We're gonna go and do this for the London asthma example in just a second. But the general trend is up. As the dissimilarity in location increases, so does the dissimilarity in the data. You remember, that was my corollary of spatial correlation. As the distance between observations increases, so does the dissimilarity between them, and vice versa. Data that is near to one another is also more similar to one another. Spatial correlation. Okay. That was a fun toy example. Let's do this for all of our GPs. I think we had something like 1,100 doctors for whom we had prevalence of childhood asthma. Um, and so this scatter plot contains a ton of points. The other little difference that I'm uh, doing here versus our first unit is I'm using z-scored prevalence. So I'm taking the percent prevalence, I'm subtracting the mean, and I'm dividing by the standard deviation. That way, I get a constant mean and a constant variance. That allows me to meet meek stationarity. Cutoff is now a very um, non-trivial value because I don't want, you know, I have so much data that I don't want two observations that are, that are on the opposite ends of London to influence my data. So here I'm telling R that I want to use the cutoff as half the maximum distance, right? It says half the maximum distance of all the data points. The rule of thumb is somewhere between 0.5 and 0.75. Um, different textbooks, different rules of thumb. But you never want to use all the available distances because in a realistic example, you will have less and less data that is say, 30 kilometers apart. You will have um, that particular observation depend on fewer and fewer data points. So we want to set that cutoff distance to be something like half the maximum observed distance or 0.6 or 0.7. I've seen anything inside this range used as a rule of thumb. We want a barrogram cloud. And we can sort of try and characterize the shape of this barrogram cloud. Now, I see uh, something like hedgehog, for example, and I, I'm being facetious, but if you squint long enough, you can sort of see this same trend of when we are near, when the observations are near to one another in space, they're also similar to one another, right? When the observations are near one another in space, they're also similar to one another. But then it's, it's something that kind of looks like that. Yeah, you know, we have various weird data points. Whoops, I went to a different slide, I apologize. I can redraw this. Observations that are near to one another are more similar. And, uh, you know, it kind of looks like that. So the feature is we, we tend to increase at first, and then our barrier, barrier gram cloud tends to level off a bit. Yeah, it tends to level off a bit. So how do we read this? Um, in truth, this is very, very difficult to read. The variogram cloud is, however, what R uses to produce its more classic um, binned variogram. So here's the big idea. We're gonna pool the information into distance bins. 
we don't need to know, you know, the dissimilarity between data points one kilometer apart and 1.00001 kilometers apart. I'm just going to use bins. So I have my bins all set up here. And what I'm drawing is I'm setting the cutoff at 25,000 meters, 25 kilometers. And I'm selecting 25 bins of 1,000 meters each, right? So one kilometer bins. So I've binned my distances. And now I will simply average my data, my dissimilarity inside each bin, right? I'm going to now average the similarity inside each bin. So again, be very wary of the defaults. How you cut up your distances, which the distances are continuous, your space is continuous, your Euclidean distances are continuous. How you cut up the, the, the distances is going to affect your result. How many bins you specify, what the cutoff is, all of that will affect your result. And I'll demonstrate that in just a little bit. So what would happen if you use too many bins? How did I pick uh, a cutoff of 25 and uh, 25 bins? Well, very much so trial and error. And that is going to be the name of the game when it comes to vari variograms is trial and error. And unfortunately, this is why people like to hate on variograms. Um, it's very easy to get in trouble by using defaults and by not doing enough trial and error. If you use too many bins, you're not pooling the information enough. You're not sort of blurring your eyes and letting the trend come out from all of this cloud of points. If you use too few bins, then you might be smoothing over important features in the variogram. Do we have any concerns about using the average and not the median? You should have concerns about using the average and not the median. And remember that the average is very affected by outliers. So inside of each bin, we're going to take an average. But let's take a look at, let's take a look at this middle bin right here. The vast majority of the data is here. But now we have these two outliers. The average is probably not the best summary there. But I'm telling you about the classic semi-variogram. The classic semi-variogram uses averages. OK, but we know why people like to hate on the variogram a little bit now. You have to select bins. How many bins you select will affect the result. It's going to take an average half the square difference between the observations inside of each bin. The average might be affected by these outlying observations that are actually all over, right? All over the place, we have these outlying observations. So let's take a look at what that comes up to. Here is the averages are the red dots. And I've done this manually. I divided my 25 kilometers into 25 bins, and I now plot the average dissimilarity at the middle of each bin. And on the left, it's just their original scale. So we have to zoom in, right? The, it shows you just how much data is underneath the average, but the average is to be there. So when I zoom in, I'm now producing what you would more frequently see as the official variogram. 
Here are the red dots on my average the similarities inside each of my 25 bins. Here is the formula you would see for the variogram. Notice the half, right? Half the squared difference. What we're doing, we're averaging, right? Sum divided by n. We're averaging these values. But when we're adding up, right, the half you can pull all the way out of the sum. That's what this one over two is doing. The n is how many bins you have. And this is, of course, the sum over all the bins. How do these averages behave? This is the last question I will ask you for this video. Now, it is easier to see that our variogram has that up and over relatively flat feature, right? We start at some point, we go up, and then we reach a certain point, and then we don't vary that much anymore. We vary systematically upward until a certain distance, vary systematically upward until a certain distance, and then at that point, the averages stay fairly stable as distance increases. The other thing to notice that I'm just gonna put in your head for next time, remember that we're dealing with z-scores. So we know the variance of a z-score is equal to one. Is it a coincidence that the point at which my averages kind of stop varying, you know, increasing systematically is one? Not a coincidence, not a coincidence. Our variogram will start at a certain point, increase until a certain distance, and then bounce around randomly around this variance. We know the variance is one because I know I'm applying this to z-scores, the z-score problem. So this is the beginning of our classic variogram. I know this was a lot of, uh, a lot of material here. Next time, we will learn how to read the features of the variogram and sort of um, play around with the cutoff and the number of bins, but I will quit while I'm ahead for now. I will uh, start grading your activities, hopefully be done with those tomorrow. Um, thank you guys for your um, attention. I hope uh, you stay warm, um, breathe good air, and that you are safe from COVID. Welcome to 2020. Thank you for your attention, guys.